That's psychology. Uh, so today, the behaviourist perspective. What is behaviourism? Where did it come from? What do they believe in? All the normal stuff, okay? Here's where we're going with this. Excuse my appalling grammar. We're going to be discovering what it is by describing the three key principles, although the third one is the principal one, which is that all learning is made up of classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and social learning theory. And of course, we'll be looking at positives and negatives of the approach as well, which should become, I think, pretty apparent as we go through. Here are the three uh, key concepts written down just for you to have a once over. So pause it, read them through, and then we'll take them one at a time. Okay, all behavior is learned and shaped by the environment. We are born according to strict behaviorist a tabula rasa, comes from the Latin meaning blank slate, i.e. unwritten. Everything we become is something that we become post-birth. Genetics don't mean a thing, there's no predispositions or whatever, everything's caused by the environment. And this is best summed up by uh, this quote on the page by John Watson, who basically said, um, give me a world I can control and any babies, and I'll turn those babies into anything you want me to turn them into. Uh, my understanding actually is that that sentence ends too soon, that quote ends too soon, that he goes on to say, this isn't true, but I can influence people with behaviourism. However, he's been stuck with what it is, which is that everyone says that, he says that, he can control whatever somebody becomes. You'll know him quite well in future as uh, the man that brings to you the torture of little Albert, our old friend, um, deliberately inducing a phobia of uh, a little rat that Albert was particularly fond of uh, and that's something for us to look forward to at a later date. So next up, in order for psychology to be scientific it should focus on observable behaviour which can be objectively measured rather than on things that can only be inferred or indirectly measured such as cognitive uh, abilities, uh, emotions, etc, etc, etc. Before behaviorists came along, which was sort of right um, at the start of the 20th century uh, and really picked up in sort of the 20s. Before they came along, we were at the hands of the introspectionists, who you just used to sit around, didn't bother about scientific evidence and just thought really hard about themselves. Um, and that's clearly not going to teach us very much. So behaviorists said, enough of this. Let's be scientific, let's only measure what we can actually measure objectively, which is observable behaviour. And so that also led to lots of animal studies, seeing if animal behaviour could be shaped, changed by rewards and punishments. Um, we'll meet uh, Thorndike and his puzzle boxes shortly. Uh, uh, have a Google of um, uh, Skinner, uh, Boohoo Skinner, crazy name, crazy guy. He uh, used to get pigeons to do all kinds of behaviours by rewarding them whenever they did one of those behaviours, so they do it more often, etc, etc. And he ended up getting them to play table tennis, getting them to play uh, pilot uh, missiles paid for by the military, true story, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, he was really good at feeding pigeons um, uh, little bits of food and getting them to... Uh, metaphorically or literally dance for us. And then the third and the biggie here is that learning occurs through classical conditioning, operant conditioning or social learning theory. And you really need to know about these three things, not least because in section C of your exam, uh, you will be asked almost definitely how to change somebody's behaviours. And the way to do that is with conditioning or social learning theory. So knowing this, means you've got a large part of the exam nailed, which is quite handy. Uh, first up then, classical conditioning. Stumbled across by uh, Pavlov around about uh, 1900. He was working in Russia on the digestive system of dogs. Uh, so he had quite a lot of dogs around available for chopping up and seeing what bits went where and how they worked. Uh, and he noticed that he would keep them in the dark, but he noticed that when he switched the lights on, 
they would start to salivate because of course they associated the light being on with the feeding uh, and the feeding with the salivation so he had accidentally classically conditioned to them and he thought to himself I wonder if you can do this deliberately and that's what he tried to do so in a nutshell here we see it pictorially he started off with the unconditioned stimulus which is the food and that produced an unconditioned response which is the salivation he also had a neutral stimulus which is the sound of a ringing bell which produced no response then he would during conditioning pair the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus and after enough pairings merely presenting the what used to be the neutral stimulus and is now the conditioned stimulus would create produce a conditioned response which was the salivation uh, and that's pretty much all there is to it we can apply this to lots of things and here I'm going to ask you to pause the video for a moment and have a little think yourself how can you use classical conditioning to explain development of a phobia of bees in a moment you'll see uh, some uh, initials and some yellow boxes see if you can work out what the initials are and what uh, is in the yellow boxes we'll go through those answers in just a moment okay and here's some answers UCS as I'm sure you uh, guess stands for unconditioned stimulus UCR, unconditioned response, NS, neutral stimulus, uh, and finally CS is conditioned stimulus and CR is conditioned response. Uh, and the unconditioned stimulus was uh, pain, the unconditioned response is fear caused by the sting, the neutral stimulus is the B, because the B isn't actually something you're afraid of, it's the sting you're afraid of. So there you go. Um, second way of learning, operant conditioning. Now, best way to start here, I think, is with the words of Thorndike and his law of effect. He said something along the lines of that if uh, a response to a stimulus has a pleasant or positive outcome, it is likely to be repeated, and if it has a negative or unpleasant outcome, it is less likely to be repeated. I needed lots of experiments with a puzzle box, which you can see a picture in the uh, display there. Um, it's a little box that you shove a cat in and the cat has to discover a variety of loops and pulleys and things to spin in order to escape and get a fishy reward. And he would time how long it took them to escape and he found unsurprisingly that the more often they did it, the smaller the time took because they learned that those responses to the stimuli had a pleasant outcome. Uh, so open conditioning says two things in a nutshell uh, are responsible for behavior happening and they are reward which is reinforcement and punishment um, reinforcement can be positive or negative if you give somebody something nice for their behavior then that's more likely to be repeated let's say a delicious um, processed cake mm. I'm going to do this again. Some of you confused negative reinforcement because its reinforcement is something that makes a behaviour likely to happen again. And that means that you take away something nasty. E.g. if you do your work, I won't give you that detention. Detention is something nasty, you take it away, it stops. Babies are the master of negative reinforcement. Wah! Wah! You'll do anything to shut them up. That's negative reinforcement, that is. Um, and finally, punishment. You can have negative and positive punishment as well. Uh, giving something something nasty is positive punishment because you're giving it to them and that makes behaviour less likely to be repeated. Obviously, taking away something nice is uh, negative punishment. Uh, so... If I say to you, you can't go on your Xbox, that's punishment, but it's negative punishment, take away something nice. If I say to you, um, if you keep doing that, I'm going to play Rhinestone Cowboy on the car all the way home. That's giving you something nasty, so that's positive punishment. Either way, they're designed to make behaviour less likely to happen again. 
So, have a quick look at these three sentences and see if you can work out what the endings are. Classical condition is learning by association, open condition is learning by consequences, and social learning theory is learning by observation. Learn by observation needs four mechanisms called Bandura to occur. They are attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. Arrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
What's the response? Why did that occur? It's more of, here's a stimulus, that's the response. What happened in here, in between the stimulus and response? What was the thought process involved? So it's taken us further than what behaviour in itself was able to do. And finally, of course, it's our old friend reductionism. There are many reasons that people behave. There are many influences on them. And it's quite reductionist because it says it's all about classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and maybe social learning theory to some extent. It doesn't take into account genes and anybody that has seen two children that are closely related but very different, although behaviourists would argue with this, would say that's, that's all due to conditioning. It ain't. It definitely ain't. It's due to the kids, trust me. Um, although, of course, it does accept that we live in a social world and other people influences. So there's some dovetails of stuff, but in effect, it is pre-reductionist. So there you go. Next up, we'll have a quick squeeze through Bandura. Take care.